If you watched the previous video about using the ultimate electronic hand warmer for producing heat, then you probably know already what's coming up on this, which is displaying a temperature of 94 centigrade. And what we have there is another <coughs> flashlight. Well, before I get started on the discussion of this new model, let's have a word about what's on everyone's minds these days, and that's the virus. Specifically, we're going to talk, because of what we do here, about the virus and hand warmer safety. I know most of you are self-isolating these days and working from home. Of course, I'm used to being home all day with no friends, so this is not unusual for me. Fortunately for me, however, she who must be obeyed still has to go to work and they are so busy right now, her and her team, that she forgets about checking up on me or rather checking up on possible solder damage on her dining room table. But when she gets home, she has changed the term tactical repositioning that she used to use and calls it now social distancing, especially at bedtime. And as well, I'm trying to persuade her to stop telling her co-workers that she suspects that erectile dysfunction constitutes the basis for an underlying health concern. I think that's unique to my situation. Now on to the hand warmers and what we know about the virus, which you probably already know already. I'm not a medical expert. I'm only regurgitating what I just looked up on Google for what temperatures can kill the virus off. And that's what we're going to discuss with relation to which hand warmer you may be using and what precautions you may need to take. So we've got a couple of different styles of hand warmers here. And let's talk about the liquid fuel guys to begin with. Now, most of the liquid fuel hand warmers uh, usually achieve a temperature of at least 135 Fahrenheit, and that's about 56 degrees, I believe, around that in centigrade. Now, if you look it up, you'll find that um, they say that 56 degrees centigrade was responsible for curling the SARS virus and uh, I'm basing it upon that. Uh, you'll also find that they recommend washing your clothes in water temperatures of 60 centigrade uh, rather than a cold water wash or warm water wash of 40 and of course that would pertain to the pouch that you're using. So these guys need to be washed at 60 in order to get all possible virus out of them. Normal operation of these should be sufficient, the heat that they generate, to kill the virus on them anyway. However, if they are performing poorly and not up to standard, there is a chance that they are not reaching a temperature which will kill the virus. The um, John E. GI, for example, that goes in here, reaches 165, easily kills off the virus, but even when it's in the pouch, it's doubtful that it will be killing the virus off of the surface of the pouch. So again, washing your pouches on a regular basis right now would be a very good idea. If you don't feel that your hand warmer is up to speed um, and you don't have the ability to check it, for example, I use one of these style of temperature sensors and I tape a probe right to about the uh, center of mass on hand warmer and get the temperature that way. I don't recommend using an infrared uh, spot gun style because they don't take accurate temperatures from shiny metal objects. So if you don't have a meat thermometer in the kitchen like I used to do when uh, she who must be obeyed didn't know what I was up to um, then if you can't touch it 
and hold on to it, you know you're around 165. Uh, even around 135 is about the spot where you get to where you don't really want to hang on to it anymore. Anything that you can actually hang on to, it's, it's not going to be hot enough to kill the virus. And that way you might end up using something like this, which would be isopropyl alcohol, take a paper towel and soak it with your isopropyl alcohol, wipe it all down, and obviously let the alcohol dry off before you light it or you're going to have really hot, really hot fingers. Sorry about that. And on to the electronic hand warmers. This style only achieves about 50 and it's doubtful whether that would be hot enough to kill the virus on the surface. So even the ones that claim to reach 60, when we've tested them, it's pretty difficult for it to actually achieve that temperature. So again, for the electronic hand warmers, I think you're going to want to move over to the alcohol solution and maybe clean those once a day until we get through this pandemic and things go back to normal. One of the reasons we can expect more heat from this particular host than we got out of the one we did in the last video was a function of how much current that it draws uh, measured in terms of amps or milliamps. So what I've got here is a graph which I stole from a website. The link is down below in the description and it's showing a comparison on the Nichia 219C LEDs, the 5000K models and I believe the 4500 we could expect something similar to those and we will check that when we do an actual tail cap test next and you can see here that or you saw in the original part of the video I don't want to refocus this um, there are three of them here so this green line here is showing the Nichia 219B and it's showing it again here they're calling it voltage and then here's the 5000K guy here now we are going to be looking for here what we're interested in is how many amps this guy's drawing in terms of getting the maximum amount of heat when it's on the full output and what we're seeing from this graph is an indication that the current is going to be 6 amps which Again, we have moonlight, which I think I will have to look it up 10 or 20 percent, they call it. So, moonlight, low, medium, and high. Six amps, and it's no wonder it got so hot. Now, I'm not really sure why it did no apparent thermal regulation. So, you may have thought it, um, she who must be obeyed would probably sum it up best if she came in and found me unwrapping this light when it was 90C. She'd say, well, Mr. Muppet, um, are you trying to kill yourself? You've let this light get away up to 90C and what do you have next? An explosion? Thermal runaway perhaps? Well, in fact, uh, if you do some more of those Google searches, depending on what you read, there is a consensus within certain guidelines that you can probably apply. And um, the first one being that it's generally thought that you don't want to operate on a steady basis a lithium ion cell uh, much above 60 degrees C which indeed is where the Chinese have put the cutoff point for the electronic hand warmers and what we've seen in the previous videos is, is they rarely tend to get that hot especially with uh, real field use in your pocket when it's cold out. Now while 90 is very very hot um, what you will find, and again, if you look on the links below and you want to read up on what happens with the dynamics of thermal runaway, that 
happens when the battery shell exceeds 200 degrees C. So we have here the battery shell and this guy, excuse the magnet, could have potentially reached 100 which is still only halfway up to getting where that shell temperature might be getting dangerous and the internal temperature of the cell reaches a thousand C um, the melting point of copper is uh, just over that just shy of 1100 around 1085 C so a thousand C is where you can get this thermal runaway happening and you can have a look at this chart here to see what stages are involved with thermal runaway and the temperature down there along the bottom so that's the point about the safety of it uh, apart from perhaps melting your uh, things in your jacket pocket or burning your hands um, that's why I didn't have an explosion even though I did pull them up and move and wrap that light up into a carbon felt sandwich and then uh, promptly went away into another room now on to the realities as well so you can see that this has been running on high mode while I was talking and now it's not wrapped up in a carbon felt blanket on top of a bench and you can see that we are slowly working our way up to where we are now at 50 and it's going to be interesting to see where uh, we reach the highest mode on this light which is on the high setting now the other thing which you can be aware of is that if you are getting too hot in your pocket at this high setting of course you can control as you saw with the, the test the various modes so there we have low we have medium and we have high and again back there's moonlight mode and I'm not sure if you can even you can probably just see a bit of a beam there yeah on moonlight and there's low there's medium and there's high so you can control the temperature accordingly and what I'm going to do now is leave this to run for a while and see what temperature we've got at where the probe is here after it runs for a while and it's not insulated and wrapped in a pouch well I'm waiting for this temperature to ramp up there's one other thing that I should mention which is the differences you'll recall in the previous video we looked at an M1 host and it uses the single LED now because it's single the beam patterns are different between these two hosts which might have some influence as well if you were planning on using this as more than a hand warmer and actually wanted to use it for what it was intended for which is a light now these are very powerful lights and this one has a more of a focused beam pattern in other words I think of it as being more of a spot so that it's concentrating the beam into a more of a center focused area for illuminating a targeted area this guy because it's got the three LEDs that are in that smooth reflector pattern this is more of a scattered crenulated uh, beam where it's more of a flood by crenulated I mean if you put this on a wall you'll see crenulations all around the outer edges of the beam pattern whereas this one's going to be a more of a halo uh, kind of a penumbra effect on that and crenulated on this so you would use this if you wanted a flood pattern in order you want to look around and illuminate uh, the largest possible area in front of you 
whereas this guy would be more used more for looking for a, at a particular point where you're focusing your beam. And because the Nachia LEDs are renowned for having a much higher color rendition index than the Cree LEDs. And so if you're looking at very accurate color rendition when you're looking at your area, um, for example, when we were doing human wildlife conflict use and we had a cougar attract near town, um, at night I would have to go out and get the SD cards out of the cameras that we had near the bait to pull the cougar in. And the first thing I had to do in terms of occupational health and safety considerations was look around in the trees above where the camera was to make sure I didn't have a cougar sitting up there waiting to pounce on me. With the headlamps that we were issued and the lights we had on the ends of our firearms, they were about 6,500 Kelvin and very, very poor at getting the different renditions and colors between tree bark and the hide of a cougar, for example. I ended up using my own light to shine up in the trees where I could easily differentiate the differences in brown colors. And also for search and rescue, blood on the surface of snow when you're looking for victims that have been caught in an ice fall or avalanche is much better with a high CRI value light. So if you're doing any kind of search and rescue work or work in the woods at dark where you do need to differentiate things that are around you, these Nachias are about the best you're going to get and you want the lower wavelengths around 4000K rather than 6500K. So those might also influence your purchase decisions for those lights. I know some of my coworkers much prefer to have the 6500K on the end of their firearm so that they can do those long distance shots. But because we do human wildlife conflict or did before I retired two months ago in the urban areas and even in the town site uh, with a shotgun, the high CRI value was much more important for my considerations. Well, it's been about 15 or 20 minutes and this thing seems to want to hover between uh, 57 and 60 when it's left undisturbed. I would assume that when in a pocket outside with some air going in and out of it, you might be looking at temperatures uh, lower than that. So it does not appear as though it's going to reach a battery temperature that's going to be harmful to the chemistry of the cell. And with that, I see it's almost time for She You Must Be Obeyed to be arriving home and I better get those dishes washed and something ready to cook for dinner. I almost forgot one last postscript which addresses the question of what do we do if I find it's getting too hot in my pocket and I want to not burn my hand. You can consider any number of generic cases that will fit this size of light. Uh, one such as this where the head is still exposed or a compact one such as this one where you can completely cover the head, seals with velcro or this larger more rugged one such as that one which also has a spare battery holster on the side of it.